start and thank Barry and Robert and Madhulat uh, uh, for this invitation to the workshop, which I find very inspiring. As I said to uh, Barry, not so much solving my individual problems, but promoting some things that I think are important for me and possibly for the community. So. This is what I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to, to ex explain these things at the example of our code there, which is for strong field physics. Um, and uh, here you see a, a typical result uh, for a problem that is uh, moderately complicated. This is hydrogen atom, okay. Um, uh, in such a field, this is the f actual field strength, and you see there is not much... Of, of, of symmetry left and uh, correspondingly you get these beautiful colorful roses as a result in the photoelectron spectra distribution in the plane. Um, uh, it's a 3D calculation, it's not a completely trivial uh, problem but it's something that you can run during a presentation and I did that actually. Uh, I don't do it here. Um, so uh, this is, that's comparative, that was hard I guess a while ago. Um, now, just to set the stage for maybe a few people who are not fully in that field, um, uh, this is strong field physics, means interaction of strong, short pulses with matter. means we solve the Schrodinger equation as, I don't know, 30% of physicists today are doing, um, but under the condition that we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, sometimes we have a source, never mind, uh, it's strong field means we have electric field strength that is comparable to the fields at the valence shell. Um, and it's short pulses means they are short comparable on the time scale to the typical internal valence time scales. Um, the interaction is usually dipole but not necessarily. This is, a, as you all know, a fast moving and maybe known, well, obviously, experiment driven field. And the things that people look at are ionization coming in various flavors, single photon, which is relatively easy, it's basically perturbation theory, multi-photon tunneling. Um, there is high harmonic generation, that is a, obviously a massively non-linear process. There are photoelectron spectra where, which bring in, the, the, you, it's clear that you cannot escape continua as a very important uh, player there. It's in very often rather non-perturbative, not just a little bit, really off. Yeah? That means complete, complete loss of symmetry uh, in the valence shell and sometimes significant loss of structure. Um, when you do these things as a theorist, you, cover, you, you, you encounter a wide range of complexity starting from 1D single electron mo models, which can be inspirational, uh, to all the way to really up in issue, correlated, multi-electron dynamics and emission. Yeah, so that's, you saw some of that in uh, Fernando's talk. Bottom line is, if you try to cover parts of that, you will obtain a complex and a code that is also rapidly changing. Um, now, T-Rex, stu I stumbled into, into by, by, by trying to organize students' work because I was getting the same errors five times from five students. As, and I was getting annoyed by that and said, let's do it once and then it's right. Yeah? Um, so it, it's t intended to be then in the end, uh, now I want it to be a flexible, performant environment for hard problems in strong field physics. By flexible, I mean it should be easy to put new models in and do quick pilot studies. Uh, also, on, 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 on a more code level, it should be abstracted such that we can qualitatively change models, change to new coordinate systems, change discretization method, modify the shape of equations with moderate effort. It should be performant. I want it to be good, good enough to do real calculation on par with code that specializes to one task. Um, and that means, among other things, it should be parallel and be able to do large-scale computations. Um, it should be an environment. That means it should be easy to define a problem. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean it. Foolproof inputs. <laughs> um, I will comment on that. Uh, and then on, more on the code level again, uh, modular, predefined things for things, uh, modules for things that you need to do again and again. And if you have done the third time, you real, you're realizing, no, wait, this is one thing. You do it once, right, and that's it. Huh? it. 
uh, yes, uh, I'm do uh, I realized I may be in a minority, which surprises me. I'm doing C++. And no way. I did Fortran for 20, 30 years, and I'm very happy doing C++ now. OK, hard problems means uh, we want to do multi-electron emission and dynamics in strong fields. But I, I mean, I know that Fortran now can do a lot of things, so I'm not making a religion out of this. Technologies. Um, methods. There are two methods that started the thing, that is infinite range exterior complex scaling, which is a fancy name for complex scaling with a smart discretization. Um, and T-surf, which is time-dependent surface flux, and which is what it says, it's a surface flux method in the case that we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian whose time dependence reaches beyond the simulation module, basically. That is the main point that distinguishes it from standard surface methods. And this is how the name came about, because I had a uh, Italian student who had a, a feeling for sounds, and he said, T-surf and Erex, this is T-Rex. Okay? So, okay. Um, then, uh, having gotten the nick of uh, acronyms, I found HAC, the Hybrid anti simulus Coupled Channels, which is, if you want to know what it is, ask uh, uh, Fernando, who's doing something very, very similar. There's barely a difference. I'll comment on the little details. Um, basically, it means we have a CIs, functions, Gaussian-based, uh, and combine this with a grid, by which I mean a grid, I mean usually a FMDVR grid, um, uh, which producing an overcomplete hybrid basis of these two, and its, it's, it's workings are very similar to what Fernando said. Uh, I want to list among the methods the, the, the kind of uh, indexing that we use uh, that is tree product basis, similar maybe not in, in, in its actual use, but formally to what we have seen yesterday. Um, that is, you have a Product basis, okay, nothing really exciting. The only difference is that you have a hierarchy and the lower levels can be dependent on all upper levels. That means you can put a little bit of correlation into that basis or actually relevant amounts. Does it, yeah? Does that just mean that you, you have levels and that you can start off with a, a less complete basis and then just build up the basis gradually? No, we are not, I mean, we are not extending the basis on a certain, this is mostly to capture coordinates, say, or things like that, yeah, yeah. Di directions, degrees of freedom. But you can do things like this, you get, say, you're uh, thinking of XY plane, you don't want the whole plane, you can easily do things like that, for example, that is the, the advantage. Um, then for basis and discretization, this is a very abstract scheme, so we can plug in various things, finite elements, finite DVR, discrete indices, anything numerical, like this object that you, of course, recognize. Uh, here you see, need this the dependency of hierarchy. This is the upper level, this is the lower level dependent on the upper level, and what you get is, what you get is spherical harmonics in this case. Yeah. Uh, you, we play these games in, in various contexts, it's quite useful. We also can do hybrid, I mentioned that. We can mix different bases in the same place. Uh, the example I already mentioned is molecular orbitals from a CI together with the FEMDVR, but we can also place off-center polar coordinates, bases. We can combine spherical and cylindrical uh, coordinates, which because we are, have mixed different areas with different symmetries, we need these transitions. The laser pulse doing linear sim uh, cylindrical symmetry here near the nucleus, it's still the atom uh, dominating. Okay. And here is the alternative explanation of T-Rex that is recursive code structures, time-dependent recursive indexing. This is not a very convincing explanation, but it is, it's okay. Um, um, Multidimensional objects are recursively handled throughout the code. Uh, C, it's a C++ template class, a tree, uh, which embodies something like this. Uh, we have a wave function, which is a linear combination of one function times the rest. So this is a recursive idea. And you can do the same with operators. You have an operator matrix, which is an oper mat operator matrix multiplied by another matrix, possibly. Uh, there is, as you immediately recognize, there's a little redundancy in the way this is done here. Uh, but that, uh, I commented that. So punchline, a vector is a vector of vectors, and operators a matrix of operators. OK? Uh, this was first done to get a hold of, of we had been doing three different uh, coordinate systems and so on, so, and, and uh, easy way to do ma many dimensional things. Um, but what I found in the process is produces extremely transparent algorithms. It's really beautiful. 
Uh, you can easily exploit block structure, for example, here, even if it's rather irregular. Uh, you can exploit tensor structure, well, if applicable. If there is a meaningful tensor structure in your operators, you can. Here you see this. This is alternatively either th there are many zeros or there is a tensor product. Mm -hmm. These are the two, two good cases here. Yeah? The bad case is it's nothing. Yeah? <laughs> it's full. Um, parallelization is there. I want to, we can do, we have parallelization. We have tried Petsy. I want to comment on that. And it's inconclusive. That's an, an embarrassing thing to say, but uh, it's the student's fault, probably. I don't know. <laughs> no. uh, when you say inconclusive, it, it's, it's slower so far than the homespun. I thought, ah. come on, these are pros, and I'm doing this home. I think it is the student's fault. We find the same thing. Okay, good, good to hear. <laughs> good to hear. Because I wasn't quite sure. I was. Okay, good. Okay. It's okay, but it's nothing special. Okay. So I reduce my efforts trying to get this better. <laughs> um, it has some adaptive features. Maybe uh, it has some dynamically basis feature, if you like. We switch, we move up parts of the operator that we know at the moment don't do have any effect. And if, if the norm comes up of that part of the vector, we switch it on. So that, and that gains factors. As you know, these games, you're playing this all over. More on the software side, uh, code structure, this is Doxygen. Uh, if you do C++, you get Doxygen for free. Uh, I mean, not in, time, in terms of paying, but in terms of effort to get this kind of documentation. And here we have basis functions. They come as ionic CI, neutral CI, as cosine sine, as DVR, as grid, as incoming functions, as whatever. Yeah, This is typical C++. Uh, also, this produces this kind of diagrams, which tells you how your classes are interrelated. And the interesting lesson for me was I learned this through, through a student. They know more about this stuff than I do, some of them. Um, and when I first threw the code in there, this was spaghetti. And I knew we had a problem. Yeah, so you see the structure of your code. Um, very nice. Uh, we have utilities. I want to mention one thing in the sense of clarity, foolproofness, documentation. We have funneled all input through one class, which only you can only write, you can only access, put input into the code if you document it. I can, you can still write something nonsensically, but I, barely any student is as that stupid or mischievous. Um, but so this little, it's very, this at no cost, basically, yeah? And you have it, and you have it in the documentation. Uh, similarly, output less advanced, we have uh, systematic warnings, messages, uh, classes for that, that encourage to monitor your code as it's going on, which is extremely important for us, and hopefully maybe for other people. That's what at the present user interface is looking like. Um, yes, I want to cast this into a GUI. But um, basically, we have an axis, which could be the phi axis, eta, which means cosine theta, or the r axis coming in two pieces from 0 to 25, from 25 to infinity. And you can specify which functions you want. Here, polynomials, degree 20, and then polynomials times an exponential damping. Um, so that's the way how you define your discrete. You can permute this stuff as you like. Um, you can have a, a range of uh, axes that you can define, which oh, these are obvious. This is prolate spheroidal coordinates. You can just have discrete axes. It's rather easy to extend this. Uh, you can then put in operators. Well, Laplacian, obviously, you need all the time. So it's predefined for various coordinate systems. Permutation always is, is gratuitous once you have defined it for one permutation. Um, but if you don't like to write it like that, you can write it like that, uh, which you could recognize possibly if you were familiar with this. Huh? I'll, I'll explain it one in one. This is one term of the. Uh, no, this is this is just this is just polar coordinates. Nothing nothing special. Uh, this is uh, one term of the polar coordinates Laplacian. It's one on the phi axis. It's Derivative to the left on the eta, cosine theta axis is this term. The derivative to the right and is one over the Coulombic or the repulsion. This way you can very, we have, and this is a very easy operator. We have at times operators like that, and that's essential to get this into the code without getting it wrong. Or essential, very helpful, let's put it that way. There is testing in the code. We have a standard test suite uh, against a certain set of tutorials, which is useful when you're developing. Because no matter what you do, you screw up sooner or later. Yeah? 
and you, you know the code has many functionalities, so you, you want to test a range of possibilities. This is handled by some nice Python. Well, actually, it's already outdated. That's the problem with all those fancy things. They are fashionable for two years, and then they are outdated three years later. Uh, <laughs> OK, um, good. Let me show you one more. What else? Yeah, we have internal checks, very important for life again, as a, both for the user, I believe. There's not that many users. Um, but definitely for us, if things go wrong, it stops, it warns, diagnosis. And there's a principle that I already mentioned. If it fails once, there must be a check. No matter, a new promise, I won't do it again. Don't believe you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is a slightly more complicated discretization. This is this hack discretization that means an ionic state with one electron with a lot of flexibility glued to it and maybe adding some neutral states to it. That is what the input looks like for that one. Two neutral states, six ionic states, and this is the freedom for the electron. We get, of course, that means we have pre-computed pre data from Columbus. OK, does the approach work? Yes, we have produced helium double ionization at 800 nanometer. It's not easy. Uh, we have produced CO2 uh, photoelectron spectral channel resolved, also not easy. Uh, this is, I don't want to go into this because it's lost on the vast majority of here. Uh, it's feasible. These are the typical runtimes on that scale. We, we did at one point push it, but there's not much point. We need parameter studies. We don't know that one big calculation. Yeah. The performance, uh, my mantra is it's methods, not software. Yeah. However, this said, of course, it's algorithm and software, but the, the big gains are how you how you start the thing, understanding the physics and so on. Still, we, did, we took part in a hydrogen benchmark that was set up by Brett Esri. Um, it has difficulties, but I liked it after all. We, we performed, maybe I liked it because we performed reasonably well in it. Um, uh, but I mean, we, hydrogen is something I don't care, yeah, because it's, yeah, it's too easy. This is not what the code is for. And still it was OK, although I did some massaging, I must admit. Yeah, I, I wanted to be good in that, of course. Yeah? Um, <laughs> But that's what I mean, it, it should be okay. Uh, okay, now let, this, let me skip that. I, don't, I want to come to the general part because I'm running out of time a little bit. What uh, Barry asked about our experiences, they are very sorry, they are very down to earth, like uh, we just had to learn how to write code. Although I had done this for a long time, I hadn't, didn't know C++ and I realized that I didn't know, in course of that I realized I didn't know many other things that are not specific to C++. And, and maybe some of that would go under the title of software engineering, how to maintain things, how to structure things, and so on. Um, I definitely adamantly now say abstract, 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 and general. It helps. You get clear code. You get better algorithms. It's maintainable. It's error safe, very important. Clear logical structures means you have less errors, and it just throws up uh, when you, uh, and it gains speed. That was not expected, but it's such. My general experience, it's faster. It costs. It costs thinking. You need to do the abstraction of your problem. And that, of course, whether this is worth it depends on the complexity that you're dealing with. The single largest problem in practice was interfacing. This has been addressed by Fernando. And it's, we are not doing a beautiful job on our output side either. So I'm not happy with that. Foolproof code, uh, and we are our biggest fools. That's good. Uh, uh, users have tried it, and they are so far restricted. I didn't f hear things as horrible, or, but the possibilities for input are maybe not as complex. Usability seems to be OK, uh, but the exp ex experience has been with a few people, and there was always direct contact, so I cannot really make uh, lessons. Learn, teach, and force software engineering on a basic level. We don't want to become software engineers. But we need to know these principles. I, I see this is, we have implemented part of that at LMU. And I see an improvement which may be coincidental in my students or really already showing the working. I was thinking, for who do we write the codes? Mostly for our elves and a few friends. Uh, we would like to write this for the community. Interfaces I mentioned. Here I want to already suggest uh, sh we should be thinking about, isn't there a way to, to, to better establish a culture of communicating the things. Yeah? Let's put it that way. I would like to bundle information like this comparison of codes. There's so many things out there, and you don't know what does what under 
is very limited in what we can do, but I think it's a, I, I like, that's why I like this initiative. That also means that we have to find a, a language that makes it uh, possible to understand uh, slightly. Um, and I particularly like that discussion about testing and errors and valid, uh, validation. I think we should try to work to create this culture. Uh, and I now uh, I conclude with just repeating things that I've heard here and which re resonated in me very strongly. One thing is, okay, what could we be doing? I thought this idea of having one place where people like us can put their codes and maybe there's a meeting place and there is a language, uh, a language, a way of talking about codes establishing itself. So there's a minimum set of common rules best simply emerging by saying, come on, what is that? And maybe we can agree on a one format how to exchange information about, I don't know, a wave function or whatever. Um, I, Jeppe Olson said that explore the full range of methods. Yes, but that means we need a uh, low threshold for doing such a comparison. We need some framework to do that, and it brings me back to that one, and error assessment. I think we can do a lot of that uh, as reviewers. I'm not... If I, if, if, I, if I see statements about a complicated situation, like we solved the time-dependent Schrodinger equation and we got that result, I have a strong tendency as a reviewer to ask, yes, how exactly? Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, of course, as journal editors, you have to be a bit more uh, 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 thought of. So here, as a, as a reviewer, I can just I'm a, I have a, an opinion. Um, and I'm not kind of like absolute on that, but as an editor, you read. So uh, to, to make a st strong statement, calculations without error assessment are useless. If, if I cannot tell that this is right within a factor X, what does it mean? It means nothing. Okay? This is an extreme statement, maybe. Productivity was another word that came up. Um, codes should be usable without understanding them. Without fully understanding them. And code should be extendable without fully understanding them. And this may be more important than being fast by a factor three, in my opinion. Thank you for your attention. This is for the web page.